Welcome. I am Pastor Logan Stout, for some of you that don't know. I've been here about three months now, so you guys are a little confused as to who the man speaking in front of you today is. I actually do work here. Um, I'm a young guy. This is my first pastoral job. So I get a lot of times from students, they ask me, are you a real pastor? And I usually chuckle, and I, I don't know the answer to that question, so I usually question them back with, what do you define as a real pastor? And it's seemingly always they answer with, do you preach sermons? And I'm like, well, I teach GPS on Wednesday nights, and that's like a sermon. And then Sabbath school on Sabbath morning, that's also like a sermon. They're like, no, like in front of a congregation. And I'm like, well, you know, and I start to give an answer, and I usually get interrupted with an O. So... I'm inviting you all to my coming out party as a pastor. This is official. I guess now is the day that I become, I can wear my name pet tag or whatever it is. But as I invited you, I would also like to invite our Heavenly Father. Please pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, I'm so thankful for you and your blessings. I'm thankful for your blessing of a Sabbath day so that we can come and learn and grow in you. You have bestowed upon my heart a message, and I ask that you bestow upon my lips that same message this morning. Father, we love you and we cherish you. Be with me and my nerves. In your name, amen. So like I said, this is my first real job. I've had a lot of jobs over the years. Go through a few pictures here. I owned a company when I was 16. It was called Logan's Lawn Care. I mowed grass for mainly old ladies. Actually, that's, I'm not 16 there. That's like three months ago. <laughs> yeah. But I, I didn't have one, so I, I put this one up. That, that was not a real job. Later in my life, I worked about, I don't know, when I was 18, I worked at a place I made donuts and pizza, this very nice little gas station in uh, Sturgeon, Missouri. That, that was not a real job. Uh, I was able to do some other things. I worked at Kettering Church this last year, and I thought when I graduated from college that I would be going to Kettering Church, working with youth ministries. This was a real job. I would be doing worships and talks and doing all these different things. I'm like, yeah, I got a real job. Not until I got my first paycheck did I realize that this is not a real job. <laughs> but then I came to Fletcher Church. Oh, I worked at Olive Garden too. Not a real job. Bus tables. You guys have been to Olive Garden? You know, whenever you're there and you spill something and you're like, oh, don't worry about it. There's a guy to clean that up. I was the guy to clean that up. So I'm very glad that that, that also is not my real job. But this, this here at Fletcher, this validates that this is a real job. I had a sign that said, welcome Logan Stout, new youth pastor. I have a home that I live in by myself. I go to bed when I want. I come home when I want at 9 o'clock. I do what I want to do when I want to do, and I pay my own bills when I want to pay my own bills. So this, this is establishing the fact that, that I have a real job now. You see, the one thing about these other jobs that I didn't quite understand and I didn't really care about was expectations. I never really had any expectations when I worked at Casey's or mowed grass or worked at Olive Garden, Kettering a little bit, but I realized here that there were not only expectations for me, but I had expectations for people. I would talk to people before I came here and say, what, what should I expect from, from the church? And they're like, well, you, you know, what they expect from you is to be there at all the things and smile all the time and be a nice guy, and I'm like, oh, okay, so be a Christian person, thank you. But I want to know like, how I should expect the church to respond to things I do. And they're like, well, you're going to have to kind of figure that out on your own. I was like, okay, well, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate your kind words. You see, as I got here and I interviewed and then I started to talk to people, I started to learn something about people that I really hadn't learned before. I had seen it before, but it hadn't came across my mind. You see, in the interview, I started to get questions. And the questions, people would raise their hand. They'd say, yeah, Logan, are you going to implement this into the ministry? Because my son would really like that, and, and he needs to like the things you do. And I'm like, well, I don't know. 
Maybe uh, we'll see. I'd like to do that. You know, someone else raised their hand. My granddaughter wants to be involved in this area, so could you be sure to put that in? Or, you know, youth would ask me, can we do this because this is what I like to do? And I was thinking the whole time, but I have ideas what I want to do. That's why they're hiring me. You see, I've come to the realization that people are selfish. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but let's just see what Paul has to say about this. Turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to start a few verses back, but 1 Corinthians 9. We're going to start with verse 19, and we're going to read all the way through 23. I will probably be going, well, I don't think I have the answers, but the Bible does, so I will be flipping through and through the Bible. Try to keep up if you can, and if you can't, we'll have it on the screen, so it's very convenient. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 to 23, I am reading from the New Living Translation. It says, Even though I am free with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law, so I can bring them to Christ, those who are under the law. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. Let's start back with verse 19. Paul says here, Even though I am a free man with no master... I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. Paul here is stating that he is a, a free man. He has no master. Yet he's also stating that he is a slave. Now, I'm not the smartest man alive, but I do know that usually a slave has a master. And in order to be... It's just confusing. So Paul says he's not actually talking about a heavenly father. He's not talking about his heavenly master here. Paul lived so much of his life working as a slave for money. He worked as a slave to persecute Christians. It said that Paul once killed Christians, and now he is living to save them. Paul is now a lay preacher, writing messages to churches, working solely for the Lord to lead people eternally to Jesus. Martin Luther once said, A Christian man is the most free Lord of all and subject to none. A Christian man is a ministering service and servant in all things and subject to everyone. So Paul and Martin Luther were on a same level here. When Paul was made a slave on his own accord, it was voluntary. He got rid of the chains of sin and, and entered into the chains of the kingdom of heaven. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, if you can turn with me there, if not, you can look up. Verse 20 to 24. It talks a little about this uh, same enslavement. He says, because this is in the same letter, a couple chapters before, that's one thing I really enjoy about Paul's messages, is that you can turn back in your Bible and you can understand what's happening. It says, yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let it worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. It, God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Paul was a lucky man. He was able to give up his life to the calling of God. But he is telling us not to worry about it. If our lives seem terrible like that of a slave, you are free in Jesus Christ, which is the one thing that a slave longs for. He longs for freedom. He thinks that if he's free, he's happy. But Paul's saying here that no, just because you're free, that doesn't guarantee happiness. Happiness only comes through your heavenly Father. So if you remain a slave, but you're still in Christ Jesus, happiness will come because you're enslaving yourself to other people, not to your master's. If your life is holding you back from happiness, then give your life to God, and he will show you true happiness. Paul says here, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people. It says the Corinthians were pagan Stoics. And they believed that, if I can get this properly, 
Pagans believed that when you worshipped a pagan god and you submitted your life to them, you were risen up. You were better than other people because of this. Paul is kind of maybe poking at them a little bit, maybe confusing them a little bit, philosophize, I don't know what that word is. Um, anyways, he's, he's trying to make a point here. He's saying, with my God, you're no longer lifted above people, but you're below them to lift them up to the same level that our God is lifted. You try to bring as many people with you. And it says in Mark 10, if you, could, you can turn with me there, or not. it says in verses 43 to 45, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, became, came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as ransom for many. You see, Paul is bringing it directly from Jesus' words. He's saying, I'm not a slave because I say that's the best thing, but this is what my Heavenly Father has told us. Okay, let's, let's move on here. In verses 20 to 21, stay with me in 1 Corinthians 9. Paul says that when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. To bring the Jews to Christ, when I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law. So I can bring them to Christ, but I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. It is important to remember here that Paul was once a Jew and was willing to go back to this lifestyle of living with the Jews if for the sole purpose to bring people to Christ. He had to clarify this idea he was having because if I came to you guys and said, I think I'm going to be a Muslim for the next few months, I would probably have to give you guys a little more information than just saying that and walking off the stage. He, he had to tell them. He's saying, I've been a slave to religious ceremony and ritual in the Jewish law, the law of the Old Testament, and at this time it was important to live by this law. You see, uh, Everyone was caught up in the law. They were saying the law was the most important. The fundamentals of the church, that's what they were founded on, the commandments in the Old Testament law. Let's, let's look here in 1 Timothy. Paul talks about the law and the people of the law, like he's talking about here. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 9, it says, For the law was not intended for the people who do what is right. It is for the people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinless, who consider nothing sacred and defile who, what is holy, who kill their father or mother and commit murders. So he's saying here, I'm going to live back with the people under the law because these people are sinners. They don't have Jesus in their heart. They have laws in their heart. And these people, you don't need the laws. The laws aren't necessary because when you live in Christ, the laws come naturally. You abide by these laws because they are there. You see, when it comes to Gentiles, Paul also mingled with them. The Jews and the Gentiles, you hear that rather regularly. It's not that Paul lived a life with no ideals of the commandments. When he was with the Jews, he acted as a Jew. And when he was with the pagans and the Gentiles, he did the same thing. There is no way, meaning he was no longer a Christian. He was still a Christian. He was just acting to the people around him. This, um, this New Year's, I was able to go on a little trip. I went to Europe, very beautiful place. I went to Paris and London. Um, I went to Rome. I went to the Vatican. Uh, I was with a, a very beautiful young lady here. We are at the Trevi Fountain. There's, it was really crazy. When we were here, there were people that would come around and be like, can I take your picture? Can I take your picture? And I thought I was like really famous, but they just wanted money. Um, <laughs> so that was disappointing. Um, but as we were here, my favorite part of the trip, I love the trip, you know, we went all over Europe. But one of my favorite parts, and there's a man in the congregation that might be the only one that finds this humorous, but when I would come back, people would ask me what I would do. Or even before I left, what are you going to do, Logan? I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, when you're in Paris, what are you going to do? I'm like, well, I'm going to go to the Eiffel Tower. I'm going to do that. And in London, I'm going to go to Big Ben. They're like, what are you going to do when you're in Rome? I'm like, well, that's easy. They're like, what do you mean? I'm going I'm to do as the Romans do, of course. 
You guys have heard this saying many times, when in Rome you do as the Romans do. It wasn't until I started preparing for this sermon that I realized that this was actually coming from where Paul wrote right here. The true origin, you guys know who St. Augustine is, he uh, had, had went to Milan for a visit. And he observed that the church did not fast on Saturday as did the church at Rome. He consulted St. Ambrose. He was the bishop of Milan at the time. This is like 487 or something, maybe 3. Yeah. Times aren't important. He said, when I am at Rome, I fast on a Saturday, as Paul said. When I am at Milan, I do not. Follow the custom of the church where you are. The comment was changed to when they are at Rome. They do as they see done. This is by Robert Burton, not important. But it eventually came to when in Rome you do as the Romans do. Well, this is what the same thing that Paul was saying here. He felt about his ministry. He was going to be embedded into a culture. Then he wanted in every way to be at one with his ministry. And people he's ministering to. You see, if I came to church and I went to primaries and I was like, guys, open up your hymnals. We're going to sing some hymns with the organ upstairs. They're going to be like, no, we're not. We're going to sing Jesus Loves Me because that's what I want to sing. And, and, and so often we find ourselves absorbing cultures until we get a little older. And then all of a sudden these cultures are done away with. We have to just live by this law of, yeah, we can stay on the music, of hymns. We say, well, you're 18 now. You should just listen to these hymnals and listen to this classical music. Well, well maybe as adults, myself and you all, we should, we should say, wait. If, you know, the youth, you guys are interested in a different kind of music, but still praising God. Let's look at that for a little bit. Let's, let's join in together. And as youth, we can say, wait, there's got to be something good with hymns. These things have made it through hundreds of years. We have to absorb ourselves into cultures, cultures in our church, cultures in our age groups. We have to be at one with each other. We have to understand each other. You have to realize if you're on someone else's turf, then you have to play by their rules. That doesn't mean you have to give up what you believe in, but you have to understand where they're coming from so that you can raise them up to the Heavenly Father. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 21, but I do not ignore the law of Christ, or of God, I'm sorry, the law of God, but I obey the law of Christ. What's the difference? You hear God the Father, you hear God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How is the law of God different from the law of Christ? You see, in Mark 12, Jesus was asked by a religious teacher of the law. They said, which commandment was the most important? Jesus answered in verse 29, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart. So everyone you love, you should love like, like the Lord did. With all your soul, everything you think, all your mind, everything that comes into your mind, it should be of godly and all your strength, everything you do physically should be of God. But then he continues, the second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. I think about this as I was interviewing and being asked questions about my ministry, how I didn't do it, and how our church doesn't do it. We say, hey, Logan, you should do this because of my son. Why don't you say, hey, Logan, my son's in church, but his friend, he likes to do these things. Why don't you bring this into our ministry so we can bring our neighbors to church? I don't know my neighbors. I just moved in three months ago. I know John. He lives next to me, works at Nationwide. He has three kids. They come twice a month. Nice guy. But other than that, I don't really know anyone. Why aren't I asking John to come to church? Why aren't, we, why aren't we asking our pastors, hey, you know, with Space for Grace, this is what we need because I have friends that would come if we had this in our ministry, not because I want it, but because our neighbors need it. You guys are here. You guys are here for a reason, because you love and adore the salvation of Jesus. But, but the people that aren't here that you know so well, what could we do in our church to bring them in? What can we do to love our neighbors as much as we love ourselves? Because we love ourselves a lot. We love ourselves so much. We always want what's best for ourselves. We buy ourselves nice things. But then even me, like this Christmas, I was out shopping with a good friend. He's like, what are you getting your brother? I was like, I'll just get him a, a shirt or something. And he was like, wouldn't you buy yourself a nicer shirt than that? And I really had to think about that. I was like, why aren't I loving my own brother as much as I love myself? 
I did buy him a nicer shirt than I was going to. When you hear this, Jacob, you'll be happy for that. Um, we, don't love our, we don't love our neighbors. We don't love our family as much as we love ourselves. Now, as a father, I don't know that love. I can't say that, you know, my mother says, she's like, I'll love you more than any woman ever will. You know, she tells me that all the time. Sorry, Mom. But it's true. It's a different kind of love, and I can't grasp that. But we love ourselves so, so much. What if we took that love and we were like, no, I'm going to love the person next to me today. I'm going to put him first. I see his need in the church. Why don't we embrace that? I'm doing okay. I'm living for Christ. He needs the Lord right now. We're going to go on in 1 Corinthians 9 again. Verses 22 and 23 will start. It says, when I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything I can to share the good news and spread its blessings. Who are these weak people that Paul talks about? Before we heard about the Jews and the Gentiles, and he explained that he was going to live with them under their law. But he's not explaining anything about the weak. Because the weak are the Christians. The weak are the people in his church. Paul had already talked about the weak a chapter before. Let's look at this in chapter 8. We can flip back a page or two. This is a big one. Let's try to grasp the meaning here. It says, But you must be careful so that your freedom does not cause others with a weaker conscience to stumble. For if others see you with your superior knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, won't they be encouraged to violate their conscience by eating food that has been offered to an idol? We have to be accountable for our own selves. We have to, to make sure our actions don't cause other people that might be struggling, the weak people, to stumble. So because of your superior knowledge, a weak believe, believer for whom Christ died will be destroyed. Think about that for a second. Because of what we're doing as Christians, when we might do something that we know is wrong, but think no one sees us, and when they do, that person could be destroyed because they'll never look up to a Christian person again. With, when we have superior knowledge, we need to lift up the people by living and setting the best example. And when you sin against other believers by encouraging them to do something they believe is wrong, you are sinning against Christ. So if what I eat... What do I eat? Just what we eat causes another believer to sin. I will never eat meat again as long as I live. For I don't want to cause another believer to stumble. Our diet, the simple things that go into our mouths, can cause the other person next to us to see that Christ may not love us because the people that we look up so, to so highly can't even live in Him. It's so difficult, they think. Verse 23, 9, verse 23, once again, it says, I do everything I can do to share the good news and spread its blessings. Some texts say he does all things for the sake of the gospel in the order that I might become a partaker thereof. In this key ending, he states that his mission is of the gospel and he spreads this message because the gospel message promises eternal life. And if I must live my life to see Jesus, it is worth doing such things. Paul had the same love for others that we need to have. The love that Jesus had. The love, the message of the gospel. How many of you guys like to golf? Yeah? Anybody? Raise your hands. I love to golf. How many of you guys have a husband that likes to golf? Or a dad? Or maybe a mom? Golf is for everyone. I, it's my favorite sport. Well, to play. Anyways. I love golf. You see, golf is a... Um, how, how can I put this? Golf is it's, it's important when you play golf. To play golf with people that you get along with. My favorite person to golf with is my father. Me and my dad often this summer would go out, just the two of us, and spend, you know, the three, four hours golfing together, having a good time. We complimented each other very well. He knew what not to do to make me irritated, and I knew exactly what to do to make him irritated. So it worked out perfect. 
Dad and I had a great time. Anytime you put someone else into the mix of our golf, it, it didn't seem to go as smooth. And that's not anything against anyone that golfed with us, like my brother, or uh, that was it. But um, I love golfing with my dad. I love golfing with my brother, too, but we're really competitive, so it's like, I'm going to beat him, and I was winning, and it's just sad for him. But um, anyways, I love golfing with my dad. About a month ago, I got an email from my father. It was entitled, 18 Most Annoying People to Golf With. And I said, now this is going to be interesting, because 18 is a lot. That means it was basically trying to cover everything that anyone could ever do that's annoying on a golf course. But I went ahead and took a few of these guys and talked about it. You see, when you golf, you guys know the concept. You hit a ball from the tee to the hole, and you count how many times it takes to get there. It takes a long time to play a game of golf. The first most annoying guy is the cell phone guy. You see, when you're golfing, you want to leave everything in the car. You want to leave it back at the office. There's always occasionally this one guy that thinks, no, no, it's business, hang on. And you see, with golf, if you guys haven't played much, you always have to wait for the person, the last person in the group, so you don't, you know, you don't get hit in the head. You don't want to get hit in the head with the golf ball, that would be painful. So the cell phone guy makes your, your round go from three hours to six hours. This is not. If you go golfing, leave your cell phone on silent. These people can just, yeah, they're, they're on the list for a reason. The air counter. A very no annoying person to play with. It happens, though. You see, you, like I said, you get there in as many or as few strokes as possible. You see, there's this, always this guy that goes and he hacks and hacks and hacks. And at the end of the hole, he turns around and he starts counting his strokes that he hit and how many times it took him. And then he comes up with a very incredibly low number. He's like, it's a par four, you know, four strokes to get in the hole. He's like, oh, yeah, I got a five. This dude got like an 11. Like, like, yeah, you're turning around counting because it's a high number, not because you did really good. The last guy I'm going to talk about here, the ball retriever guy. If you ever see a bag sitting in the middle of a fairway but no one around it, that's because Jim Bunch is off in the water with his ball retriever. You'll know this guy if, you're, if you don't golf and you walk into his house or into his garage, and you see a bucket of dirty, dirty golf balls. And you're like, oh, he must love to golf. No, he doesn't actually love to golf at all. He loves to look for golf balls. He wastes $30 to go out and search for golf balls instead of paying $5 for a sleeve. No offense to Jim. Great guy. But this, my dad does that as well. I'll be like, Dad, it's your shot. He's in the woods. I'm like, Dad, what are you doing? He's like, I found six balls. What do you mean, what am I doing? This is a great day. I lost eight, so I'm down two. It's perfect. Very annoying, no offense, to play with this guy. So I called my dad, and we talked about this for a while. I'm like, Dad, that, that was funny. That was great, you know, the, you know, all these different guys. I was like, what was your most annoying? I was like, well, what was yours? And, and we both agreed immediately that the most annoying person to golf with was the swing instructor. <laughs> you never ask this guy for advice, and he's always the one telling you what you're doing wrong. He's by no means a pro, and even if he is, golf is supposed to be fun. If I wanted to spend money on lessons, I would have. He tells you all these things that confuse you. If you don't play golf, know that golf is a very mental game. You see, you swing, and you hit it well, and you try to mimic that every time. And this guy comes and puts all these thoughts in your mind, and he changes this, and he changes that, just to annoy you more, and you make you feel worthless at your favorite sport. Do you see how selfish we are? Salvation is not a matter of right and wrong, but it so often turns into a matter of I'm right and you're wrong. We see someone that is different than us and we automatically think it needs fixing. You see, so often we look at people and think they have no grasp on God. We see them as Paul described them to be as weak. They are struggling they are in need of someone, anyone, to reach out to them. They want a friend, not a judgmental friend. Just a friend, not to be told what is right and wrong, but to be told it's okay. Maybe they're reaching out their hand, and instead of us saying, who touched me, we're saying, why on earth would you think I want you to touch me? I'm going to heaven, now get your sinful hands off me. 
You see, maybe Paul said to the church that if they were weak, then be like the weak. Because compared to Jesus, we are all weak. We all need strength and power to lift each other up. One Sabbath morning, an old cowboy entered a church just before services were to begin. Although the old man and his clothes were very worn and ragged, in his hand he carried a worn old hat and an equally worn out old Bible. The church he entered was in a very upscale and exclusive part of the city. It was the largest and most beautiful church the old cowboy had ever seen. It had high cathedral ceilings, ornate statues, beautiful murals and stained glass windows, plush carpet, and velvet-like cushioned pews. The building must have cost many millions of dollars to build and maintain. The men, women, and children of the congregation were all dressed in the finest and most expensive suits. Dresses, shoes, and jewelry the old cowboy had ever witnessed. As the poorly dressed cowboy took a seat, the others moved away from him. No one greeted him. No one welcomed him. No one offered him a handshake. No one spoke to him. They were all appalled at his appearance and did not attempt to hide that fact. There were many glances in, the direction, in his direction as the others frowned and commented amongst themselves about his shabby attire. A few chuckles and giggles came from some of the younger members. The preacher gave a long sermon about hellfire and brimstone and a stern lecture on how much money the church needed to do God's work. When the offering plate was passed, thousands of dollars came pouring forth. As soon as the service was over, the congregation hurried out. Once again, no one spoke or even nodded to the stranger in the ragged clothes and boots. As the old cowboy was leaving the church, the preacher approached him. Instead of welcoming him, the preacher asked the cowboy to do him a favor. Before you come back in here again, have a talk with God and ask him what he thinks would be the appropriate attire for worshiping in this church. The old preacher uh, muttered to him as the cowboy was leaving, and the cowboy assured him, the preacher, that he would do that and left. The very next Sabbath morning, the old cowboy showed back up for the services, wearing the same old ragged jeans, shirts, boots, and hat. Once again, the congregation was appalled at his appearance. He was completely shunned and ignored yet again. The preacher noticed the man still wearing his ragged clothes and his boots, and instead of beginning his sermon, he stepped down from the pulpit and walked over to where the man sat all alone. If you... Uh-oh. <laughs> I thought I asked you to speak to God before you came back to our church, the preacher said. I did, replied the cowboy. If you spoke to God, what did he tell you the proper attire should be for worshiping here, asked the preacher. Well, sir, said the cowboy, God told me that he wouldn't have the slightest idea what was appropriate attire for worshiping your church. He says he's never even been here. Now, I know for a fact that Jesus has been in this church. I felt him. I feel like Je Jesus is here no matter what, through the good times and the bad. But sometimes I feel like it's not completely about Jesus. Jesus loves us, and he loves the way we worship him, whatever way that is. He loves that we're different. He loves that we're quirky and weird. He loves all the things about us. Jesus loves us when we're rude and judgmental. He loves us when we look down upon others. And he loves us when we act nothing like he ever would. But I'll tell you right now that's, that it's not always about Jesus. The reason that is is because we don't make it about him. We abandon his teaching and act mean and rude towards people, looking at them different because of their decisions. 1 Peter 3, 8-12 to says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil. For evil, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will bless you for it. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. 
Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. And his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. You see, sometimes it's important to gain the approval of man more than the approval of God because God loves us. He loves that we keep his laws and commandments. He loves that we are good, fundamental Christians in every sense of the word. We believe in the doctrine found in this holy Bible, and we teach it to those around us. But sometimes those things overshadow the work we should really be doing. Sometimes the law of God overshadows the law of Christ, of loving your neighbor. As humans of a sinful nature, it is very easy to be turned off by that. It's very easy to see a person with all the answers instead of a loving heart. Sometimes we should put the fundamental beliefs aside and focus on the fundamental beliefs of Christ the love Christ had for all of us.